Good morning, guys. We are here with our Bible study today. We're moving faith forward every day <laughs> with the Word of God. And, and today we're in Psalm 21, and we're talking about exalt the Lord, how to um, exalt the Lord through our decisions to put Him first and to um, let Him be our provider. So we're going to be in Psalm 21, 13, and just starting out in that one verse in the book of Psalms. Hi, Michelle. <laughs> Good morning. Okay, Psalm 21, 13, um, it says, Be thou exalted, Lord, in thy own strength. So will we sing and praise thy power. Hi, Ravi. Good morning. Um, so, be thou exalted, Lord, in thy own strength. Hi, Linda and James. Good morning, Anita. Um, I like that it says, in your strength. Not in my strength, God, but in your strength. Hi, Kathy, Connie, all. Good morning, guys. Um, so, exalted means to bring up, to raise, or promote. And um, so, be thou exalted, be thou raised up, be thou um, brought up, and be thou promoted. So, we are going to bring up the Lord. <laughs> we're Hi, Sister Gail, how are you? And we're going to raise him up, let him be high and lifted up. And so, we're going to talk about this idea of exalting through decision making. And when we go to Genesis 14, 17 through 24... Um, we read about David. Now, I messed up yesterday, and I said Psalms 22 the whole time when we were talking about Psalms 21. Hi, Lori. Um, and so, I feel terrible about that, but we all, we made it. <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I did that. Okay, Genesis 14, 17 through 21, and this is um, Abraham. And so, Abraham goes to war um, or to battle against um, um for his brother, or for his cousin, for Lot, not his brother, for Lot, and um, he wins, and so in verse 17, it says, the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedorlaomer and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheva, which is the king's dale, these words are tough, um, okay, so Abraham goes out, and he meets with the king of Sodom because the king of Sodom also was upset with these people. But Abram had his own his own situation with them. So he goes in and he defeats them. And now the king of Sodom's really happy with Abram, uh, Abraham because he, he did this thing. And so in Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. So Melchizedek is a priest, and he's telling Abraham that you possess heaven and earth. That's amazing. That is a blessing. That's a blessing. Abraham is blessed like nobody else is blessed on the face of the earth by God. And, and then he continues, And blessed be the most high God, which hath delivered thy enemies into thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. Abraham got favor from the Lord because Abraham was able to do this thing that the king of Sodom was not able to do. Hi, Ashley. And um, so he has this favor, and Melchizedek recognized that and says, You are blessed. You are blessed by God. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, unless thou shouldest say, I have made Abram rich. He is exalting God by trusting God to supply his needs and turning away what is not directly from the Lord because his interest is giving glory to God. His interest is not in the material things. He went and he fought for Lot and um, he God gave him favor. He got what he was after and he wasn't after anything extra. And I think sometimes we live in a world that's after a lot of extra and, and I like extra too. But here God needs to be exalted. And if it is just living off what the Lord gives us and that is it, you know, like just constantly being like that, that bird that, that's waiting for him to feed us. And Abraham could have gotten all these riches, and he chose to exalt God instead. So save only that which the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men that went with me. Uh, more names. Aner and Aner and Eshkol and uh, Mamre. Let them take their portion. Okay. <laughs> so Abram, he exalts God by making a decision to humble himself. I want to read. I'm reading this. Um, I have this book called The Most High the, the, my utmost for his highest. 
my utmost for his highest. And it's a daily thing, and it's by Oswald Chambers, and this is an edited version. I think it was written in the 1800s, 1860s, something like that. But I want to read something that um, stuck out. It says, whenever we rely on self-respect, we systematically disturb and grieve his spirit. Um, so the verse, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lonely in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. All we do should be based on a perfect oneness with him, not on a self-willed determination to be godly. This will mean that others may use me, go around me, or completely ignore me. But if I will submit to it for his sake, I will prevent Jesus Christ from being persecuted. Oh my goodness, that to me is so deep. If I will submit to whatever treatment God deals with me, um, gives me hands out, however people, you know, respond to your um, desire to be perfectly one with him, it will prevent Jesus from being persecuted? How does that happen? I have no idea. That's such a deep thought that I, we're, I'm going to have to meditate on that for a while. But I love the idea that your persecution prevents Jesus from being persecuted. Like we're taking it for him almost. Now he bore stripes for us, but he allows us to live in a situation where we can walk like he walked because the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And so when we walk and get ignored, what does it say? Ignored, um, people go around us. They may use you or completely ignore you. But if we submit to it for his sake, we will prevent Jesus Christ from being persecuted. I think that's really, really interesting. And it's that same thought of exalting God. Exalting God by choosing whatever outcomes happen. And Abraham exalted God because he chose not to take what the world was offering. Not to take what the king was offering. Not to take the king's favor, but to be completely satisfied with God's favor. And whatever that looks like. And we talked yesterday about losing control over the outcome. That we aren't going to try to say the the prayer has to be answered this way the blessing has to come this way but just allow god to move however he wants to move and and so if we go to second samuel 23 13 through 17 we see david doing sort of the same thing um all right so david okay and three of the 30 chief went down and came to david in the harvest time of um, unto the cave of Adullam, and the troop of the Philistines pitched in the valley of Rephim. So David, they're in this battle, Israel against Philistine, and David was then in a hold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof and poured it out unto the Lord. Now, if those guys <laughs> see, okay, so David's thirsty and these guys hear it and they go and they risk their life to get him a drink from a specific well that he wanted. Now, David, I think, was just probably talking to himself. He was probably just like longing to be for peace, longing to go to Bethlehem. And the Philistines are there. Oh, I wish I could drink from that well. And these guys heard it and they took it literally. And they went to the well and got him some water. And they bring it to David and David pours it onto the ground. Now, if I was those guys, I'd be like, you better drink that water. <laughs> I went and got that water just for you. I risked my life and here I am. And now you're pouring it out onto the ground. And he said, be, be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is not this the blood of the men who went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. And these things did these three mighty men. He did not drink the water because the men risked their life. Instead, he poured out that offering into the Lord. He poured their sacrifice into the Lord. His, his body was thirsty. He was craving that water. He wanted that water, but he exalted God and said, No, Lord, that was a sacrifice, and that sacrifice was too big for me. Only you can get that sacrifice. And so sometimes we pour out other people's sacrifices unto the Lord. Other people that have sacrificed, have gone ahead of us, have went first and brought back after their, you know, after their walk with God, they brought it back to us. Hi, Jewel. They brought, they brought back their sacrifice. They brought back what they've learned, experienced, and that gets poured out to the Lord. And so, 
I just want to encourage somebody that, you know, you've gone ahead. You went first. You risked things that nobody else risked. You, you fought the enemy. You came back with the spoil and you handed it to somebody else. But know that that offering is going to the Lord, that he sees that. It is, it is, um, a, a sweet smell to him. He loves that. Amen. He loves that sacrifice. It is not gone wasted. It is not wasted. I'm going to read this again. This will mean that others may use me, go around me, or completely ignore me. But if I will submit to it for his sake, I will prevent Jesus Christ from being persecuted. Amen. We're going to find out deeper what that means. I think God's going to talk to us about that. So, so David, he had an understanding. This was too great for me. It has to go to the Lord. And um, let's go to Luke 14, 26 through 35. Now, this is, this is Jesus. <laughs> Jesus talking. And so, um, let's see. 26. Okay. So, he, he's teaching. He says, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. That is intense. That's one of the most intense teachings, I think, that the Lord gives us. If any man come to me and hate not it, everybody you love. Now, we know that Jesus doesn't want us to hate. But what he's saying, I believe, is that, you know, your love for me has to look so different from your love for other people. That when people see your love for me, they think you hate the people in your own family. Because they see you choosing me over and over and over again over people in your family, over um, situations, over experiences, over things that other people are drawn to, you're going to choose me instead. And, and they won't get it. They won't understand it. And it might cause them to, to look around you, go over you, you know, that kind of thing. But it's a sacrifice unto the Lord. And it might seem as silly. Doesn't it seem silly, it, I mean, a little bit, that David poured that on the ground and thought he was doing something. I mean, that seems like, David, you're wasting that water. That, that, that's what it seems like. You're wasting that water. You could have used that. But you know, that reminds me of his Mary when she broke the box. And uh, Judas said, you're wasting that. That could be given to the poor. And she said, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use it as worship to the Lord. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rub all that expensive ointment on his feet. On his feet, right? The place where you would think is the least likely to be... Um, what does it say? Oh, the covered parts of the body are, are are the most exalted, are the least likely. Those feet got the ointment. They got the tears, right? The the head and the feet. And God God sees. He knows. He understands. And so and so when it seems like we're choosing wrong because we're choosing outside of the box, know that God is receiving that as an offering. And and it might just twin, be between us, right? Us and the Lord. This oneness between us and God. And so 27 says, And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Are we willing to say, My reputation is the cost, my finances are the cost, uh, my my well being's the cost. My my you know how people think about me and my rep, you know I keep saying reputation, but if you if you've never laid your reputation on the line, I don't know how far into this walk we are with Jesus. It's not just a a, a day's walk; it's a, a deep walk. Hi Jennifer. It, it's a, it's a, a a depth to the walk. We have to be willing to lay down everything for Jesus. Abraham laid down Isaac, his only son, the son of his promise for God. And so if we're going to build something with the Lord, we have to see if we have what it takes. Do an inventory. What am I willing to lay down? Am I willing to even die for Jesus? And sometimes it's easy to say, but it's, it's harder to walk the walk that would cause that than to actually say, yeah, I would do it. If that makes sense, because Nobody's going to persecute you for being sort of lukewarm. Nobody's persecuting people that are just kind of, mm, I'm just going to go. Maybe, maybe I'll make church. Maybe I won't. Maybe I'll read my Bible. Maybe I won't. Maybe I'll pray. Maybe I won't. Those people are not getting persecuted. 
The people who are getting persecuted are the hardcore, all or nothing, I'm in this for Jesus and I'm willing to risk everything. And sometimes death would be easier than what they actually risk. It would be easier just for someone to kill them than it would be to walk the walk that they are walking. And I'm, I'm not talking about us. I'm talking about, you know, in foreign countries where they're being beaten every day and, and tortured and their houses are being burned and, and threatened. And it's the fear of death that is always hanging over them. That's day in, day out, you know, torture, that kind of walk. And we're blessed. We're like Abraham. Abraham was blessed. You know, here, here's the land. <laughs> here's the promise. God pours it out. Um, and, you know, he may have had some persecution, but, you know, over there, they're getting a lot. You know, they just are. And we know that. So are we willing to lay down what little God is asking us to lay down? you know, compared to the big things that he's asking people all over the world. And um, so verse 29 says, Lest happily after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Oh my goodness. If you don't, or if you aren't willing or even count on and plan it, put it in your plan to forsake everything for what God has called you to do, we cannot so much as be his disciple. That is a very strong line. And that is God requiring more of us than we would give of ourselves. We would give just enough. That's kind of how I think humans are. We give, we would give just enough to say we gave. God is asking for everything. I need everything Everything you value, everything you care about, I want it all. And so salt is good, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land, nor yet for the dunghill. But men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. I love that the Lord's always saying, if you have ears to hear, then hear it. Don't just read it. Don't just check off, y'all yeah, read it. But actually hear what God is telling you. Hear what the Lord is requiring of you. Hear, hear the kingdom of heaven saying, this is intense. It's an intense walk. And it's going to require you to lean on God and exalt him. Not just because of praise. We exalt him through praise and he inhabits that and that is good. But he's not talking about a Sunday praise. 15 minutes of praise on Sunday. He's talking about 24-7. Will you make your life a source of praise? Will you allow God to be exalted through your humility to what he's called us to do? And the deeper we get into this walk, you know, the more he requires of us and expects that of us. And God forgive us when, you know, we didn't, we didn't respond that way. That, yeah, that is a tough word. It is a tough word. And sometimes we feel guilty, don't we? When you're doing that, because because we're doing that. Some of us are doing that to a measure. Maybe all of us. I don't know. I don't want to assume. But I assume that, you know, I know y'all and I know your walks. And, you know, we're giving it all we have. Like, we don't want to leave anything and say that was left undone. But um, sometimes that can feel guilty. You can feel guilty for that. And you can feel guilty for choosing Jesus over, you know, other things or choosing the call of God on your life over other things. And there's a guilt that comes with that. But that's just, that's just the offering. That's the offering is the response. Whenever we do something, there's always a reaction. Our action leads to a reaction no matter what it is. 
And I had to learn that a while back because I'm like, oh, I feel like things are always getting stirred up. I feel like every time I choose to do something, then this happens and this happens. And the, the Lord talked to me about it. He said, every time you do something, there's a reaction. You're, you're creating something. Something's going to respond. And so uh, we can't be in control of the reaction. And sometimes that reaction is the negative stuff. Sometimes it means that others may use you, go around you, or completely ignore you. But if we will submit to it for his sake, we will prevent Jesus Christ from being persecuted. How do we persecute Jesus Christ again? We break his heart by systematically disturbing and grieving his spirit and not following his commandments. And not giving up what he wants us to give up. Letting go of what he wants us to let go of. Those strongholds, they they want to stay on. Those those habits, those things that we choose over him that bring us joy and even it brings us a sense of peace. And God is saying that needs to come off. It's And it's not even sin. It may just be something that we lean on and cleave to where if we had been David, we would have drank the water because we were not in a position to see what David saw. God give us eyes to see and ears to hear so that when an opportunity to pour out a, an offering comes to the to the Lord comes our way that we won't miss it because we've exalted ourselves. Now David could have thought, "Oh well, praise God, these people went and they got this water and they brought it to me, and oh God loves me, and I'm going to drink this water." But he said, "I didn't pay anything for it." Did we, he's in there. Uh, that story is in there with David too, where he doesn't. He has to pay. For where the ark is going to stay. Right? I think I've got that right. He has to pay for it. He knows not to take it free. There is a cost. And we have to count the cost. And the Lord is saying before you build, count the cost. And are you willing to do that? Because if you don't do that, you're going to be mocked. But it won't be for me. It will be because you didn't give everything. If we give just enough. We can't please God and we can't please man because we'll forsake man and make them mad, but we won't give enough to do the thing we're, that's required of us. And we'll be somewhere in that lukewarm middle and God said, I will spit you out of your, my mouth. He prefers us to be hot or cold. Don't even try or else be so on fire that you risk everything. And so I, today I just feel like led to say, God, I'm, I'm, I'm submitting anew. I'm going to risk everything God require of me, what you would require and give me eyes to see and ears to hear that I would see it as the opportunity comes by. And whatever that means, humbling myself um, before the Lord. And that's scary. Amen. That's a scary prayer. And y'all know that too. When you say, Lord, humble me. I want to be humble. I want to be so humble you can use me to do anything on the face of the earth that you would that you would ask me to do. I want to be so humble that I see it and don't take it as opportunity for myself. God, forgive me. Forgive us. Lord, forgive us for when we as your people look to see opportunity for ourselves and we did not pour out that drink offering. Oh, my goodness. God, forgive me. Forgive me. Okay, um, uh, there's James 4, 8 through 10. It says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. That seems like a two-way thing. <laughs> That's a good promise. Draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. That's great. How do we draw nigh to God? Um, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. There's a little rebuke with that. If you're going to draw nigh to God, you better let that stuff go. Um, okay, so be afflicted and mourn and weep and let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. What? <laughs> That's not what we want. That's not the good promise. Why would we want to do that? Because verse 10 tells us to humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. When you feel like drinking that water... And it's just exactly what you want. And, it, and it's brought to you. How can we do something a little bit more for God? How can we push forward a little bit more? Because there were people that went ahead and fought the good fight of faith. And we're eating and drinking off of what they did before us. And so we want to exalt the Lord. And we want to honor those who have gone before us. And who have paved a way. And we want to keep up their work because there are people behind us that need to go too. 
And so we're pushing through. We're clearing a path. And that path was cleared for us, and we're we're clearing a wider path for the Lord. And the people behind us, they're going to clear an even wider path. And we need to be okay with the folks behind us doing even more than what we did, because that's what Jesus said to us. He said, you know, you're going to go do an even greater things. And we said, oh, yeah, amen, we received that. Well, what about the folks behind us when they go and do even greater things? Do we receive that word for them? Are we joyful for them? Are we happy? And God is just dealing, he's dealing with me and maybe he's dealing with you on, it costs more than what we would want to give. But if we will give everything, if we will lose our lives, then we will find it. And we will find what God has put on the planet just for us. That the blessing that Abraham received from, you know, Melchizedek. Who is like a, a type and shadow of Jesus. Let's see. Genesis 14. I'm going to go back. 17 through 24. Um, okay. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. I read that wrong a while ago. I read that wrong. And maybe it took what we just went through for me to go back and have eyes to see. He wasn't calling Abram possessor of heaven and earth. I thought that was the blessing. You're going to possess the land. That's what God had told Abraham. You're going to possess this land. But God is possessor of heaven and earth. And he gave that blessing to Abraham for his descendants. Because Abraham was blessed not because of Abraham, not for Abraham. He was blessed for Isaac. And Isaac was blessed because he would be, you know, the, the, the fruit, the tree that would bear the branches of Israel. And so we are blessed for those people that come after us. That's why God is blessing us. It is God who possesses heaven and earth. And he will be exalted. Will he be exalted in our life? Will we allow it? Because he is he is high and lifted up. He, you cannot change the nature of God. Nobody can. Nobody can change the nature of God. He is God. Whether we recognize it or we don't, whether our society chooses to lift him up or not, he is high and lifted up. We are just reflecting the beliefs of the people in our culture and what we do and what we create. We, we create these towers of Babel for ourselves and we call them politics and we call them entertainment and, and Hollywood, you know, and uh, what else do we do? I don't know. We do a lot of food, you know, all kinds of stuff. We exalt all kinds of stuff, but God is possessor of heaven and earth. And so Abraham was blessed to be a blessing. God said, I'll bless you and you'll be a blessing. And, um, let's see. Okay. In verse 20, and blessed be the most high God, which hath delivered thy enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. Our perspective, it's about perspective and what we're willing to lay down. And so we're going to pray that, that God helps us. We need his mercy and his grace to be able to do what he has called us to do in the book of Luke absolute devotion and to honor him above everything and to to sit down and say okay god I, maybe you're in a new season maybe maybe it's I, I know i'm in a new season things have shifted there's 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 something ahead of me i know it's ahead of me maybe the lord wants us to sit down like a, a business man or a business woman and go okay how, what's it going to cost what do i have to give up what do I have to do? What do I have to pay? What is it going to cost for this thing that the Lord is asking me to do? And the devil is so sneaky and he will come around and he will try to tell you that is you creating, um, you know, wanting to do something. That's just you. You're just wanting and he'll give you all these reasons of the flesh that you that you're going to go do something. And, and he keeps that stirred up so that you'll say, you know what? I, I'm trying to be humble. I'm not going to go do that. Because I want to be, I want to be um, holy and righteous, and I, I don't want to do that. But God calls us to do things. Before the waters parted, Moses had to lift his hands, and um, God requires us to put our hands to the plow. 
And so God, help us to, to stay on the plow. Help us not to look to the left or to the right, but to keep our, our hand on the plow and, and look ahead and count the cost. And um, so, okay, so in Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you for this word. We thank you, God, that you are high and lifted up, that you are exalted, that you are the king of kings. God, there's no God like you. There's none other on the face of the earth. Lord, Satan has no um, strength and no might compared to you. And so, Lord, we thank you, God, for this high calling that is so humble. It's such a humble walk, Lord, that um, it's not what we, what we think it is. It's not what the world thinks it is. It's something different. And as we grow and get into your word, God, we see that you are stripping away anything that we would want for ourselves. Lord, that it has to be all of you, all of your way, and none of our way. So, Lord, I ask that you would just help us and keep us and guide us and, and take us further and deeper into this place that you are calling. You are evidently, obviously calling us into. Lord, it is obvious. God, I thank you for the obvious, <laughs> for, the, for the evidence of your favor, the evidence of your hand, the evidence of the drawing close that is on my brothers and sisters in Christ. God, it is obvious that you are dealing with your people. And so, Lord, we, we ask that you would strip away anything that is not of you. But, Lord, we pray for mercy and grace in that fire. God, in that purging, in, in the place where you would refine us, Lord, we thank you that you surround us, that you are that fourth man in the fire, and that you would never leave us nor forsake us, God. And we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. It's got to be in Jesus' name. Amen. It has to be. Jesus' name. All right. The Lord is good and faithful, and he asks a lot of those who follow him. But the reward is great. And when he comes, the reward will be with him. And it will be worth it. <laughs> Amen, Jennifer. I will see you on Thursday. Praise God. Amen. All right. Um, Sister Jennifer, she does a Victory Mission. And it's a place for um, folks who are overcoming addiction. And it's an amazing place. So if you know somebody that needs some help, let me know. And I'll get you hooked up with Jennifer. Um, okay. All right. Good morning, Ashley. Um, okay. Well, God is good. Y'all go have a good day. And we're just going to look for opportunities where we can pour out the water. We might want to drink it, but we're going to pour it out as an offering to the Lord instead. So, okay. I don't know what that's going to look like, but we'll see. <laughs> All right. Bye guys. Love y'all.